Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Bible study of JesusLife.io. We are studying the book of Luke and we're being guided by a friend and a mentor that we'll be introduced further on, as, you always, as, as we always say. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you guys today. I'm Josie Daitia from Panama, and it is a humble privilege to have the opportunity to share um, my journey with Jesus to this program. It's through the Bible reading and praying that we all get connected with God and, and may share what wonders he has performed in our lives. So thinking about this, I will invite you to join me in a word of prayer. I'm going to close my eyes and you can, you're free to do as you will. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this show. I want to thank you for its participants and for the presenter who take the time to be here, um, aside from their many responsibilities and decide that they want to witness, they want to share a testimony with others about you living in their lives. I praise you for this and I ask that you, Holy Spirit, maybe pour fresh today on these people and our viewers so that we could understand what is the message that you have for us today. It is my humble prayer in Jesus' is holy name. Amen. So as I said, I was really happy. I'm really happy because I have a couple of friends from different sides of the world. Um, one of them, it's a member of JesusLife.io, and he has joined for quite time, quite some time ago. And I want you to to know him. I'm going to bring him to the stage, and you will be able to to know a little more about Dominic. Winston, Dominic, how are you, brother? I'm good. How are you too? I'm doing great. Um, I was saying that we have a friend from Jesus Life that I owe, and that this person is you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dominic Winston Kalku. I'm a Ghanaian, but I'm currently based in China. I lecture in economics at Lores Jinjian, a hotel management college in Shanghai. And I'm glad to study the word of God all the time. So I'm glad to be here. And I'm also glad that you are watching us live. Absolutely. Because we are live through Facebook. We are live through YouTube. And you can. You, you can reach. That will be a blessing. Dominic, um, you were saying you're from Ghana and you're currently yes. in China. So what time is it in China right now? I mean, it's 9, 10 a.m. Okay, so in, in which side of, of China are you exactly? I'm at Shanghai. Um, Shanghai. People outside Shanghai, um, China usually says Shanghai, but the actual name Shanghai. is Shanghai. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that advice. I appreciate that. Let's move forward, don't we? Shall we, Winston? We have another friend. Um, she is from Panama. And she is a lovely lady, uh, a lovely servant of God. And I would like all you guys to meet her. Miss Katina, welcome. How are you? Hello, Yalcid. Hello, Dominique. My name is Katina. I'm from Panama. It is wonderful to be here with you, sharing the word of God, learning a little more. I am a payroll technician for profession, but I work in the church. I love working in the church as a deaconess, as the assistant of the treasurer, as community services. Wow. Working in the church with the children. That's my main job. <laughs> and we praise God that you're happily married, right? Katina? Yeah, my husband is sitting right beside me. <laughs> yeah, you can make him join with you if, if he's willing. We will <laughs> love that. Okay, you can talk about it later because we have somebody else to introduce and his name is Marvin and he's also from Panama and I want you guys to all to hear from him. Marvin, welcome. Hi. So happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me in this uh, very enlightening uh, program. Really, I appreciate the invitation and I am glad to uh, have met Winston and Miss Katina too. And I am very, very um, 
excited excited to to be with you and share the word of god and what what messages he wants to share through the people who is viewing us uh through us through our Thank you, Marvin. You know, I would have assumed that you know Katina already because um, she is from the circles of the Metropolitan Conference to which you attend and, and, and I do also. But um, anyway, it's a great opportunity for you guys to meet. She's from Berean Shorts. So you can meet her right now and you can make, you know, networking. Marvin, tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit more about yourself. We want to get to know you a little better for the sake of our viewers. Okay, I'm not exactly from the city. That's why probably I am from Chiriqui. Many people uh, know that, and this is in our country, but it's a very blessed place. And um, my mom and dad are from there too. I grew up there, but I went to study um, for some time in Costa Rica, in La Juela. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> and then I came back, I, I studied to teach, I taught English for some time in, in wow. some at the schools, and then I I, um, I transitioned to from work to another work here in the city you know, for another company. But as Katina said, um, work in the church is the most rewarding work that you mm -hmm. can ever find, wow. um, and and that's only because of Jesus' grace. That's, Absolutely. that's something that I can I can tell you. And, I agree well, with that. And for the sake of our viewers, Chiriqui is a is a province from the Republic of Panama. So right. when Marvin was referring him to the original from this province, he was saying that exactly. Um, is this bordering is bordering with uh, the neighbor uh, country Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you. Marvin, it's it's we're so happy to have you all. We're so happy to have you, Winston, Katina, and Marvin. And now it is our privilege to bring into the stage somebody that I have mentioned before. It's it's a personal friend. It's it's just it's a mentor and a pastor to this group and to every single one who had the opportunity to host this show. And we find great joy in learning. Um, the word of, about the word of God through his uh, teachings, through his lessons. And we're so happy to bring him again um, as our instructor in this Bible study. Today we are studying the book of Luke chapter 10. And this person who I'm about to bring into the stage um, is no other than one of the translators of the Bible. He himself translated the Bible from uh, Greek and Hebrew to English. And he has two additional versions, one in Spanish and in Portuguese that he has been working on with this free Bible ministry to which he is the president. I'm talking about no other than Dr. Jonathan Gallagher. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Nice to see some smiling faces. Absolutely. And it is great for us to, you know, talk about the book of Luke chapter 10 today, Dr. Gallagher. And, and we're so happy, as, as we said, to have you here. Now it is our important moment to share what is the question of today, because you know, Dr. Gallagher, that we are people that want to make others, you know, inquire about these things and you know analyze and, and get to conclusions because that's exactly what god wants us to do and for today's question we have this who is my neighbor so the question for today studying luke chapter 10 we are asking you to just elaborate on this who is my neighbor so in the context of the book of luke chapter 10 please we encourage you to go into the into our comments and in Facebook and in YouTube and share with us your thoughts as to who is my neighbor according to Luke chapter 10. And this will be what we're going to talk about today. And I encourage our friends here on the stage that please look please pay close attention to the teachings today because at the end we will encourage you to share your takeaways uh, in the context of this question. Who is my neighbor. So that's the question for today regarding Luke chapter 10. So without further ado, it is 
important that we start our Bible study immediately. So Dr. Gallagher, please pray for us and lead this Bible study. Yeah, it's my privilege to do so. And maybe I can just add, by the way, Joel Sib, we are also working on a Indonesian translation, which we are trialing at the moment. And I'm sure that Winston's going to be interested. We have one that's coming out in Mandarin Chinese, not Cantonese, but uh, I guess you can uh, uh, read it and look at that. That might be interesting for you. That should be ready in maybe two or three months. So uh, we'll uh, keep you updated on that. But for the moment, let's invite the Lord to be with us as we study this really interesting chapter. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving this chance to study, to read your word together. The most important thing that we can be doing, especially right now in this very troubled world, we pray that you may give us your peace in our hearts. Whatever might be happening out there, we can trust in you completely. We can have confidence in you because we believe in you as the almighty God. So be with us now as we study and may we look forward to an eternity together with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, picking up either your hard copy or your phones or whatever you want to, as long as you're looking at Luke chapter 10, then we are together. And we begin with a section that is Jesus sending out not just the disciples that uh, we normally think of. That was last week. We studied that when he sent out the 12. This week, it's all about sending out 70 of his followers to go and share the good news. And this was a very good idea because Jesus is trying to get the good news out to as many as possible. I mean, he can't do it all himself. So he asks other people to help him. And here we have another training exercise, I might even say, because later on, they're going to have to be doing that themselves without the physical presence of Jesus, letting people know about the good news that Jesus came to bring. We won't spend a long time on this particular part of the passage, but Jesus tells them to go out in pairs and to share the good news, heal the sick, Make sure that you announce the good news by saying the kingdom of God has come there in verse 11. And for those who reject it, it's going to be worse than even what happened to Sodom. You remember what happened to Sodom or the pagan cities of Tyre and Sidon and so on. So they go out and in verse 17, the 70 come back. And they're really excited. They say, even the demons do what we tell them in your name. And they're so excited that this has been such a successful tour going around, preaching the good news, letting people know about Jesus. Even the demons listen to what we tell them to do. And Jesus replies in a rather interesting way. He says in verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Well, what's that got to do with what he just said, what they just said? Uh, what kind of connection is there? He saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And, of course, he's talking about his previous existence. He saw the expulsion of Lucifer from the kingdom of heaven. And so for his disciples to get all excited about the demons doing what they said isn't such a big thing. It's just part of what we might call the great controversy. When, if you go right through to the end of the book of, uh, of the Bible, to Revelation, Revelation 12, 9, there was war in heaven. And that was the conflict that began there. And we say this as being part of it. Jesus saying, I know what this is all about, and I've seen something even more significant, maybe. That's what he's trying to tell them, that Satan has already been expelled from heaven, and whatever happens with him and his followers right now, that's not even the most important thing. He says, I've given you this power, 
But don't take delight, verse 20, that the spirits do what you tell them. Just be glad that your names are written in heaven. And there's a kind of a, not a warning exactly, but an encouragement or a piece of advice for us. to Think about the positive. Don't worry about the demons. Think about whether your name is written in the book of life there in heaven. That's where we begin. That's what we need to be thinking about. And then he's, he just gets really caught up in the spirit there. And he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've hid these things from the wise and clever people and revealed them to children. Yes, Father, you are pleased to do it in this way. And then Jesus tells his disciples, so many people wanted to see this time, time of my coming to this world, but they didn't see it. So you are truly privileged and you should be really, really happy. So that's the beginning. That's the first part of our study for this time. And so maybe we'll just pause there and ask, what do you get from this? What do you learn from the way in which Jesus sent out the 70, their response and how Jesus responded to them and his delight in the fact that God chose to do it this way, sending out these disciples and most of all, sending him to come to this world, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world and so on. What do you think? What do you get out of this particular part of John chapter 10? Um, can I share my view? Yes. Yeah. Please. Looking at the 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 description that the Bible gives and how you have you have described it, um, I think this is a motivation to us as Christians and as people who would like to go on missions. Mm. The the disciples came with a testimony, and it looked like they were surprised that even demons were obeying them in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And looking at the response Christ gave them, referring them to um, Satan being um, sent out of heaven, right. basically tells us that um, even on the before we go on the mission field, Satan has already been defeated. So that is a great motivation to us, even before we go on mission field. Mm. I like that. I yes. Like that. Yes. He, he is the enemy, so let's remember that. That's a, a good point. Thank you very much for that, Winston. Anything yeah. else? I would say that what you, you just mentioned, that um, we should not be worried because we know that the we should not worry about the enemy. We should just focus on trying to do the work that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on what's going to go wrong or or the demons that are around us doing tramping us or, or distracting us, but we have to keep focus on the mission that God is sending us out to do. Mm -hmm. Good focus, yeah. Uh, something Any other that from you, Marvin? Yes. Yeah, something that draws my attention in in this particular part, this initial part, is 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 the very the very fact that this 72, this, this group of, of men that were sent out, they were also given this uh, particular, um, not say power, but the, the ability of mm -hmm. looking to the, to the celestial, right? I mean, they are common people, that they, through the, the contact with the Lord, they can see demons mm -hmm. that obey the word of God. I mean, it actually crosses over to the spiritual realm. Right. Something that had been shut up from mankind from the very beginning of this world, if we, if we can recall. The, 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 the spiritual was shut up from the from the this realm from this world but through the very contact with jesus with with jesus they could as what happened with um with the servant of 
uh, uh, Elijah, you remember he could sow the many angels that were fighting with them. So this is what draws my attention. And this is what also happened with us. We cross over through the, through the celestial realm, back top with the power of our Lord Jesus. Right. Wouldn't it be good to have those spiritual eyes to be able to see like that? Like you said, Elisha prays for his servant. Open his eyes, Lord, so he can see. And when he looks around, he says, look, my Lord, I see the hills full of chariots of fire. And he suddenly realized, as Elisha yes. says, there is more with us than there are with them. And that's a great story. People should go back and look at that whole story in the Old Testament. But we need to move on because we're coming to the part that really is the focus for our study this time. An expert in the religious law stood up and tried to trap Jesus. This wasn't just an ordinary question. He was trying to find some way of catching Jesus out. He says, teacher, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? And that's a question we all kind of ask, isn't it? And it's interesting that he's asking, what do I have to do? That is often the way we tend to see it. And yet when we come down to what you have to do, it's not exactly following behavior at all. Let's read what Jesus says. He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answers the question with a question. Jesus he wants to help people to understand. He draws the thinking out of them. And the man replies, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole spirit and your whole strength and your whole mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Quoting the law from the Old Testament in two different passages, in fact. And Jesus says, you're right. Do this and you will live. And what are you doing? You are loving. And that is to do with the way you are. It's not saying, uh, well, if you go and feed the homeless or if you go to church or if you pay a tithe or, or whatever else like that. He's saying none of that. It's he's in, Jesus is endorsing the man who says, love God totally and love your neighbor as yourself. And the man feels like, well, maybe I answered it too quickly or too easily. Uh, I don't want to seem like I didn't do my job. So then he says, in verse 29, let's read it. The man wanted to vindicate himself. He wanted to justify himself in the eyes of everybody looking. And he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Good question. How does Jesus answer that? You know the story, right? That parable. We don't get half of this because he tells the story of a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's attacked by robbers, strip him, beat him, leave him for dead. Then a priest comes by but ignores him. A Levite comes by, ignores him. And then I think the people are thinking, and now here comes just an ordinary person who's going to help him. No, it's not even a Jewish person. Who is it? Who comes along right now? After the priest, after the Levite, who comes? Samaritan. Samaritan. A Samaritan. Yeah. Now we have to pause for a minute, ask ourselves, who is a Samaritan? We don't know. We're just reading this story. He's obviously not one of them, but what do we know about Samaritans? Maybe you can help me. What do you um, know about Samaritans? I think they are, the Samaritans are um, half Jews. They, they have an aspect of their lineage coming from the Jews and an aspect who, which is a non-Jew. So they, they, they are somehow related to the Jews, but uh, be, they, they had some cultural barriers 
and mm -hmm. the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans as it was in those days. Yeah, they yeah. were not they were not part of the of the of the people of God, but and they rather they were not given any land, so they were outcast. Uh, matter of well, saying, they were descended from the people that were brought in to replace the ten northern tribes around Samaria, which is why they were called Samaritans. They eventually adopted, as Winston was saying. Uh, some parts of Judaism, they but they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, and the Jews didn't see them as Jews, and uh, there was a great deal of animosity. Uh, they were not accepted. I think you said, Winston, it went a bit deeper than that. <laughs> I would say there was a great deal of hate on both sides. So let's... Think of the group in your society that is despised the most and you start getting a picture of who a Samaritan was. Now, what does this hated Samaritan do? Did you read on? What does he do? He cared. <laughs> he cared. Yeah. Thank you. Robert. He helped. He helped. That's right, Katina. He, he, he didn't just say, oh, there poor boy, you know, I'm so sorry for you. Uh, no, he picked him up, cared for him, took him to the nearest inn, treated his wounds, had to leave but left money for him to stay there and said, when I come back, I'll pay more. He really went the extra mile. And all the Jewish people listening are going, Huh. That's incredible. That's ridiculous, maybe some of them are saying. Why did Jesus tell this story? What was the question again? Who is, who is my, my neighbor? neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And in this case, who was the neighbor? Someone he met in need. Someone in need? But who is Jesus really pointing to as the neighbor? He's pointing to somebody that is not myself. Right. He says at the end, which one of these three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by robbers? And what did the lawyer say? <laughs> I, I want to. I want to, for the sake of the study and and coming coming to 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 us right now. I I I also am drawn to this idea, uh, doctor, in everyone. I'm I'm drawn to this idea. If, when, before saying it, when the response when the when the question of the lord to the when the response of the lord to the question of what shall i do to gain the, the eternal mm -hmm. he he described what to do he described actually what a human being must be mm -hmm. like a loving person to his creator and a loving person to his neighbor that's yeah. the first that's the first description of a human being, then I'm drawn to the idea, the, the actual, the current idea that is all around that when you are, when you're okay with yourself, you can be okay with others. Mm -hmm. This Samaritan person was a, was a human. It was a Samaritan, but he was, he knew how to be a human, like, yeah. like the creation of the Lord. Then exactly. that, that's what I am drawn to in this part, that yeah. that if a person gets to the level of being, because the, the answer is love, love the other as you love yourself. If you're going a little bit more, if if a person is depressed and is not fine with himself, actually doesn't even want to feed himself or care if it's wounded. 
or so many other things. But if you are if you are not talking about mental illnesses, but if you are fine with yourself, you love yourself and you know how to love others and you know how to take care of the others, other, other, others needs. That's wow. what Jesus wanted to compel them to understand. Yeah, that's great. And thank you, Claudia, for that comment that's just popped up on the screen. That's really great. We'll take a look at that when we start looking at the feedback later. But I want to push the point. Which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who attacked, was attacked by robbers? What did the lawyer say? <coughs> he replied by saying in verse 37 that he who showed mercy on him. Yeah, as I have it in the free Bible version, the one who showed him kindness. What does this reveal? The man, the lawyer, can't even say the word Samaritan. He doesn't want to say the word Samaritan. He says, the one who showed him kindness. I don't want to say the Samaritan. Isn't it amazing? He asked the question, who's my neighbor? But he has so much cultural hatred of the Samaritans. He can't even say their name. He can't even say Samaritan. Just said the one who showed him kindness. And what does Jesus say after that? Well, good, go and do the same. Go and show kindness to the Samaritans, to the Jews, to anybody. That's how you demonstrate who is your neighbor. So in this beautiful way, Jesus challenges them to rethink their their prejudices, their discriminatory tactics and everything else, whether, <clears throat> whether it's a cultural group, racial, the Samaritans came from a mixed race, as uh, Winston was describing earlier on. So you have racial overtones, you have linguistic overtones, you, you have cultural overtones here. Any form of discrimination, Jesus is saying, no, everybody is your neighbor. Doesn't matter. Color of the skin, where they came from, the language they speak, none of that matters. As Paul says later in Galatians, there is in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So there's an amazing lesson for us this time, kind of already answering the question that is for today. But before we get into all of that, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to just get to the last part because there's a very important point in all of this. They go on walking down the road, they come to a village and a, a lady called Martha invites Jesus to her home, it says. We later on find out that that's where Lazarus lived. But it's not called Lazarus's home. It's called Martha's home. And we don't know why. And in this part of the story, Lazarus isn't mentioned. We don't know why. Maybe he was gone. Maybe he was traveling. Maybe he was sick. We don't know. But he's not part of this particular story. This is Martha's home. And who's her sister? His sister? That is Mary. Then Read verse 39. What does it say in verse 39? And it's so easy to skip over all of this. One of you like to read verse 39. Verse 39. Mm -hmm. And she said, sorry, and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. All right. What was she doing? She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Yeah. Do you realize what that means? That, if, anything, that anything else was not important, just sitting down at Jesus' feet, listening to him. That's true. And we'll see that in Jesus' comment. But the fact that she does this and that Jesus allows it, means that Jesus accepted a woman as one of his disciples. We mustn't miss this. 
the fact that she sat down there and listened to his teaching and he didn't say you need to leave means that he accepted women as his disciples. And when Mary, Martha comes in and says to Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work for myself, tell her to come and help me. I think that Martha was really saying, that's not Mary's place to sit there with the men as one of your disciples. I don't think that's what she should be doing. She should be doing women's work with me in the kitchen because that is the role that women played in that society. But Jesus is saying, no, she's here and she's my disciples. And then he tells Martha not to be upset and says, only one thing is really necessary, as you're saying, Katina. Mary has chosen the right thing to be my disciple and it shall not be taken away from her. You are not going to take away Mary's discipleship. I have approved her. She's sitting at my feet. I'm not rejecting her or throwing her out. She stays here with me. Now, do you see that as being something far more significant than the way that we normally read it? Sure. <laughs> you know, we sometimes say, well, why didn't Jesus have one of the apostles being a woman? That might have been a bit more difficult in that society. But Luke makes it very clear that women were supporters. We saw that in an earlier study. And here we have a woman disciple clearly sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teaching, acting as a disciple. And I love that fact that Jesus tells Martha that Mary has chosen the right thing. What is the right thing? Not just to listen, but to accept his invitation to be a true follower, a disciple of Jesus. All right. Well, we've, as always, had to cover a lot of material in a very quick time. But maybe now we go back and just look at it overall and start thinking a little bit about what this chapter is saying to us. Maybe we'll start by talking about the story about Mary, as we've just finished talking about that. How do you relate to the insight that Jesus accepted women as his disciples? I believe it's a controversial matter, Dr. Gallagher. And yeah. we today in our church are constantly dealing with it and we're still dealing with it in, in, yeah. in several aspects. Um, but I think it's important that, as you mentioned, we remark that it, she was a, she, it was Mary, it was Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and, and being accepted as a disciple. And it, and it means that, um, as we said early on, that it doesn't matter your, it, 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 is, it is not about your religion or your race your gender we are we are we have all received the calling from jesus and he's asking all of us all of us to just reply and say here i am i'm eager to do the job absolutely thank you for sharing that joseph because martha clearly was the leader in the house it was her house she had the privilege of inviting jesus but Mary is the one who takes advantage of this and decides that she's going to spend time in there. Now, my wife, who is always spending a lot of time in the kitchen, feels quite sorry for Martha. <laughs> Why shouldn't Mary have helped her out? And... She never has enough help in the kitchen. She's always doing things by herself. She can relate very much to Martha. But Jesus isn't saying that food preparation isn't important. Everybody has to eat. This is really, but I think that means that he's looking for an underlying aspect here, which I, as I said, I think is Martha saying, that's not really her place to put herself there with the men 
as one of your disciples. So that's why I'm calling her out to help me in the kitchen. You know how the ladies will say one thing but mean another. And I think that's what's happening here. He's tr she's trying to get Mary away from that position that she probably thought wasn't appropriate or something like that. She's trying to get her to come out and start helping her with the food preparation. Important. Jesus needed to eat. The disciples needed to eat. Everybody present needed to eat. The cooking needed to be done. And I don't think Jesus is saying that Martha's role was not important either. But uh, only one thing is really necessary, as you were saying, Katina. What really matters in this whole story is that people take the chance to learn from Jesus. And there's something we need to, all of us learn. We need all need to, symbolically speaking, sit at Jesus' feet. What do you think? How do you read this? I want to share also some something in this matter. Um, practically speaking, I mean, Jesus is not, as, as, as you said, doctor, condemning the, the, the way Martha looks at what she has to do, but mm -hmm. probably also making her rethinking the why she's doing it. Yeah. I mean, uh, the New Testament, Paul said that, um, well, I, I'm sorry, uh, the Lord said, the, the gifts were given and some of some were teachers and some others were preachers and some others and so on. Here is Jesus himself trying to make Martha rethink her 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 way of thinking about mm -hmm. why is she doing the cooking. I mean she's doing it for the Lord, which is yeah. in her home. And Martha Sorry, Martha is doing that. Mar Mary is listening, focusing on what the Lord has to say because she's compelled to do so because she is out probably being given this, this gift. And, and Martha is not necessarily wrong, but she's wrong in the sense that she, she needed to be focused on what she's doing, but doing to whom? That's mm -hmm. what the Lord wants she to understand. Both mm -hmm. things are right because both things are directed to the Lord. You Did you notice oh, yeah. it says in verse 41, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about all this. What did Jesus mean by all this? Was he really just talking about the kitchen work? No. No. What is all this? This this wrong paradigm. paradigm. <laughs> Joseph, you were going to say something. Yes, Doctor Gallagher. I was I was thinking it in, in exactly that. What is? Um, I mean, if you look at the two people um, in the opposite sides of the room, you have you have Martha worried about taking mm -hmm. care of Jesus, which is really important when you get to somebody's home that you feel welcome. And, you know, you have a great host. But it seems here that even though we may, we may consider something important, there's always more important than that. And it, 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 it seems mm -hmm. to me that Jesus is trying to say that even there's what, what we think it's, it's common sense or, 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 or logic, it's not exactly what he's trying to bring into our lives because... Um, I've learned through my journey with Jesus that um, some some of the things that have been, in my opinion, been asked by the Lord to do are not logical to me at times. It's like, mm -hmm. why are you asking me to do this? I don't understand. Why are you asking me to love my neighbor? What if I am in war with that nation? What about that? Can I love him? Can I love her? Can I love them? It's Let's think about that. So that's for me um, very interesting. We have Mata worried about taking mm -hmm. care of Jesus, and we have Mary that it's trying to learn and right. learn. 
And part of the, all this that Martha is worried about is her sister sitting in that room listening to Jesus. That's part of the, all this. <laughs> she should be here with me and maybe, who you know, who knows what's in Martha's mind? Maybe Martha's thinking, I wish I had the, the guts to go there and sit at Jesus' feet too. I wish I really had that courage to do the same thing. But, you know, I, I just don't really feel that that's what I should do. Uh, that, that may that's be not my place. place. That's Sorry, not my Martha? place. Yes, that's not my place, says Martha. It's not my place. And, and how often have we said to ourselves, well, it's not my place to do this and this and this. I think that's part of our problem in our Christian life. We 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 say to ourselves, oh, that's not my place to do this, and I'm not called to do it. Just like Joseph was saying, you know, what was Mary called to do? She knew she should be there. I'm sure she was not ignorant of what needed to be done in the kitchen. But she um, was okay, really Liga, I have I have a quick contribution. Yes, um, yes. I really like how Jesus approached. The, the situation. Jesus, just as we have been saying, Jesus never condemned Martha. No. And th no. this basically tells us that what Martha was doing was not evil. So no. Jesus no. did not condemn it. It was something that is a hallmark of a Christian being hospitable. Yep. And that was yeah. what Martha was doing. However, something was very important than being hospitable. And that was what Jesus wanted to draw the attention of Martha to. And we, we most time find ourselves in that situation. There are so many leaders of churches, Christian groups, who pay a lot of attention to the work they've been given to do. To the extent that when it comes to sitting at Jesus' feet to listen to the word, they don't pay attention to that. So you go to big churches and you have the leaders of the churches busily running the activities while there is a sermon ongoing. And that is totally wrong. We can find ourselves in that situation, like the case of Martha. Martha should have also been at Jesus' feet listening to his word. Yeah, maybe I, she should have done, she should have just done sandwiches instead or something. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I agree with what Winston is saying. And that happened to a lot of us on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. We really take pay a lot of attention the music, the, the whatever that goes on in the church and how, many, how much time we take to pray or to make sure that somebody that is in the church, their needs are covered or personally finding that mm -hmm. connection with the Lord. And we do that a lot in church, especially wow. Sabbath. We run here and there, all kind of meetings, but how much we sit at Jesus' feet. Mm. And Only see. one thing is really necessary, Jesus said. That's the key. Well, I haven't really gone to the story about the lawyer because, Joseph, I think we're coming up to the time when we're going to have our takeaways, and the question really relates to that. So I'm going to pause now. Because I think quite a lot of the comments that is going to come are going to relate to that very pointed question of who is my neighbor and the response that Jesus gave. So over to you, Charles. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. I appreciate that. I appreciate the time you take to bring the study um, and the teachings that we have received today are very, very, very valuable. And we must continue studying because I think there's more. I would like to take the opportunity to say hi to our friends online. There have been quite some people here uh, saying hi and whatnot. Alana, for example, Alana Rodriguez, uh, she was with us very early in the show. And she was supposed to be here, uh, but she had some issue at home and sh she couldn't make it. But thank you, Alana, for sharing your thoughts. Alana basically shared a very imp interesting point that is, uh, it is so interesting that the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? But it almost seems as if Jesus responds by using neighbor as a verb, thus by implication that your neighbor is anyone who is in need near you. Very interesting. Yeah. Very True. interesting. Mm -hmm. how, co how can we identify people around us that, that, that are in need? It's not always about money or food. 
sometimes his emotional support. Um, let's pray that the Lord may give us wisdom and sight to see these people around us. Is that so we learn from him, we're able to, to reach them. Paul Anthony Kimo, a pastor and a friend, he was also a former participant of this show, and we hopefully will see him in the future. He says, my neighbor is the one God has placed in my path to bless. Thank you, Pastor Pastor Kimo. We agree. That's very important. Sometimes people is put in our path. Sometimes we may have, we might consider them our enemies. Can you think of that? Our friend Claudia Castro has also shared a very interesting thought. She says, my neighbor is anyone around me that needs help, that needs to feel God's love and mercy and whom I can lead him to. He doesn't need to be my family, my friend, or a person I know, just someone I have the chance to make good to. I agree with that. I agree with that. And sometimes these people uh, are distressful, people that cause us pain. Um, but they are sometimes put it on a pad exactly to teach us something. My teacher, Cheryl Barria, is also with us today, and she has shared quite a lot. She says, the one that helped was the neighbor. I agree with that. I agree with that because it's also written in the passage, and she has pointed our attention to prioritize. Yes, it is important for us to have priorities in our Christian lives. Now, in the context of our question of today, who is my neighbor? We will be asked as part of this show to share our takeaway. But please let us make it brief because time constraints. But um, I think it's important for us all to share this takeaway. Who is my neighbor? Let's start with Katina. Who is my neighbor is the person that's, everybody said it already, the person that is beside me, that is in need. That's my neighbor. Thank you, Katina. I appreciate it. And I agree with you. Winston. Yeah. So today, I think I've learned something new. Over the years, I've always known that my neighbor is someone who is in need around me. And that is true. We have said that today. But today, I've also learned that even your enemy is your neighbor. Because mm -hmm. the man was an enemy of the Jew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, I, and, 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 and an enemy in, in religious believings and wow. in yeah. political believings. Those yeah. are the fiercest ones. Thank you, Wisdom. So, I agree so with you that. You made a point that even someone you are in war with, when you were given a contribution, you said, even someone you are in war with is your neighbor. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Myrene, let's hear from you. Yes. Um, it's my neighbor is someone who I care as much as I care for me. Mm -hmm. This this is my neighbor, a person in need or a person who is not in need, but is someone who I would treat as I'm as I treat myself. Indeed. Right. Thank you. Dr. Gallagher, I will encourage you to do um, this takeaway as well. And, and as you take the time to elaborate on it, at the end, we will kindly ask you to just give us a glimpse of the next episode of Jesus Life that are your Bible study. Sure. Yeah, I think as we've all been saying, I agree with your statements about who is the neighbor. And of course, for the Samaritan, it was the man who'd been robbed. But Jesus told the story to show that the Samaritan was the neighbor to everybody else there. And that goes to the heart of the divisions in the human family. We exclude people. We discriminate against them because of the color of their skin, because of the way they speak, where they come from, all kinds of ways in which we are prejudiced against people who we should see as our neighbor, as our brother and sister. So I really do think that we need to talk about discrimination here and the fact that there can be no racism, there can be no, no gender exclusivism, ageism, whatever ism that is there, 
it's not acceptable within the community of believers in Jesus. So that's my lesson from today and something I need to learn because I grow up with prejudices too, as we all do. And we need to learn to let them go under the convincing power of the Holy Spirit, learning mm -hmm. to be more like Jesus. Now, for next week, as we go into Luke chapter 11, it's a very disparate chapter. There's lots of different things going on. It starts off, in fact, with the Lord's Prayer, which is going to be really interesting just to cover. He says, teach us to pray. And, well, let's. Not, I won't spoil what I think about that. Uh, we're going to talk about that next time. And then quite a bit of the chapter is dealing with the people who thought that they were so right. And yet Jesus says, you're actually so wrong because they only cared about the outside mm -hmm. and not about the inside. So our question for next time is going to be about if you're a follower of Jesus, how do you show that on the inside? Because it's all very well getting dressed to go to church in your best clothes and, and making sure you, you say all the right things to the right people, uh, but then go back and mistreat your family or you know, do all these other mm -hmm. things. You've got to be right on the inside. So mm -hmm. that's going to be a really important thing because Jesus condemns that pretentious piety. There's a good phrase for you to learn in English pretentious piety and that's something that jesus rejects god says i hate people who are like that because they think they're right but they're not so let's make sure that we come next week and see what jesus says about how we are to live and to pray and how we are not to do certain things it's going to be really important thank you dr gallagher and you made me think about this new chapter and, and and i'm eager and looking forward to it because recently i was i was watching a, a panelist discussion and they were saying um there's this individual who had an affair outside um his marriage um but what do you think about him being a politician and and not good at his marriage is it something that we could divide somebody say ah oh, I don't care about his personal life. I just want him to do good policies and just do his job well. And the other say, I don't think um, that you could divide a good um, husband from a good politician. And I just want to leave something like that on the table because I believe uh, next week we will have plenty of time and get into that because it is important that we may be able to reflect what we learned from Jesus, Amen. this theory. And we make it into practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Gallagher. And now it's the time for us to be reminded of four important aims because we, as fellow with Jesus and members of JesusLife.io, um, we constantly try to remind us of this four statements. So I will encourage you all that as, as I do the sign and repeat the phrase, you repeat it with me. So we, as Jesus Life that I am missionaries, we are, please repeat with me, we are prayer warriors. Prayer, prayer warriors. Prayer warriors. I don't know if, if Marvin could do the hands because he, he's sustaining his phone, but I don't know. <laughs> this is prayer warriors. And also, we are ambassadors of love. Ambassadors of love. Ambassadors of love, indeed. Good, good job, Kadina. And we also are fearless leaders. This is a flame. Fearless leaders. And yes. last but not least, we are powerful missionaries, and you can do this. Powerful missionaries. One arm or two arms, I don't know. Powerful missionaries. Thank you very much. Today, it was an awesome study. We learned a lot. Our neighbor could be our friend. Our neighbor could be our enemy. Our neighbor is the person that Jesus put in your path for you to practice what you learn and what you teach. Great to having you all. Everyone, thank you for watching this show. Thank you for being faithful and thank you for sharing. Should it we is pray now a moment you? to pray. Yes, that was exactly what I was about to say. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. Let's have a word of prayer. Marvin, would you pray for us, please? All right. <clears throat> Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, dearly for all your blessings, for all your, your kindness, for all your grace that you have provided 
each and every day, each and every one of us, with your guidance and your protection. We also want to ask you to continue uh, keeping us this night and in the day for those who are in the day, your protection and your, your blessing. We also thank you for uh, your word that inspired us to continue uh, doing our best and for seeing this day when we reunite with you in heaven. Please, we, we thank you and we also want to continue studying your, your word. In Jesus' name we ask and we pray. Amen. 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 See you next week. All right. See you. God bless. God bless. God bless you all.